welcome to the Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka, you can find me elsewhere online as the Crimson Stitchery, that's my username on Instagram, and you can also visit thecrimsonstitchery.com. In this edition of my studio vlog, aka knitting podcast, I'm going to be updating you on everything that I have been working on um, with a little bit more detail. Normally I release a vlog once a month at the end of every month, but this month, January 2023, you got a little bonus episode where I did an audit of my whips or my works in progress because at the moment we are running the Crimson Whip Along. This is the second time that we have run this community endeavour or make along where we are making an attempt to work through as many of our whips or works in progress, either finishing them or frogging them over the course of the next six months. Just because I don't know about you, but I'm finding that the amount of projects that I have on the go at the moment seems to have spiralled or maybe mushroomed and it's just time to try and get that down to a much more manageable number and it's so much more fun to do that together. So if you haven't done so already, do check out the Crimson Whip Along hashtag over on Instagram. And if you'd like to join in a little bit more and get a bit more involved in the action, you can do so in my Discord server which is basically like a forum um, or a chat room, if you like, where you can share your projects, get advice, and just generally get to know each other a little bit more. It's an invitation only server, so it's not like Instagram, you know, it's not just completely open to the public. And the way to get involved with that is to become a Patreon supporter. So as always, this episode is made possible thanks to all my lovely and wonderful supporters over on Patreon who keep the Crimson Stitchery going thanks to their monthly membership subscriptions. If you've been enjoying the Crimson Stitchery recently, then you might consider becoming one of my supporters over on Patreon. Tier subscriptions start from £3 per month, which in London is now not the price of a coffee. A coffee has in a coffee shop has actually ballooned <laughs> the price of that. It's much more than that now. Anyway, that's just by the by. Um, but anyway, do head over over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery to check out all of the different tier benefits and choose the right one for you. But as mentioned, all Patreon supporters have access to our private Discord server and it's generally just a really fun and lively place to be. So let's get straight to it. What's in my knitting basket, which is just down here, just out of shot to my left. I have finished the socks that I was working on over December, over the um, Christmas holidays really as well, and they are here. Um, you might have spotted that if you follow me over on Instagram, um, because I've been trying to make an attempt to update that a little bit more often in more of a casual manner and just to kind of really just to take more photos of the things that I've been making whilst I'm making them because that's um, a habit that I really fell out of over the last couple of years and it's kind of it's kind of a shame um, that I you know in, in some ways I, I stopped recording what I'd been making and I just didn't really have like fo many photographs of that so I'm trying to get better at it. So this is a pair of my Twister Lolly socks and I cast it on using just some scrap yarn very quickly um, at the end of December. It was something that I had been intending on doing for absolutely ages and then it just got to the point where I was like, let me just crack on with it. And I knit them up really quickly and I'm really, really pleased with them. So the yarn is this amazing violet hand dyed yarn and it's, in, it's got this lace diagonal pattern. Um, I didn't do the ribbed toe, I just did a plain toe. And yeah, I'm really pleased with them. Um, this yarn is Travel Knitter, um, I think it's called Super Sock. It's, it's a BFL Blue Face Leicester wool blend with nylon. And it's extremely plump and round. So it's actually a little bit heavier than the recommended yarn from the pattern. So these socks are a very tiny amount um, thicker than uh, you know, my, my other sample socks for which I used Coop Knit socks, yeah. These are both two of my absolute favourite sock yarns after having tried, you know, um, well, I was going to say hundreds, maybe dozens, <laughs> dozens of sock yarns. Hundreds would be pushing it a little bit. Um, and I recommended both of them in my top 10 socks yarn, sock yarns video. If you haven't checked that one out already, do hop over there. I put a link on the screen now. Um, but yeah, as I said, this one is very slightly on the heavier side. So it's kind of good to know that all, not all sock yarns are, you know, obviously they're not exactly the same. And whilst they can be interchangeable, um, you know, sometimes it's maybe worth... Um, kind of comparing them in the hand side by side. Uh, I did know that this sock yarn was going to be a little bit heavier than the Coop Knit sock, Socks Yeah, um, the the kind of recommended yarn for the, for the pattern. I did know that going into it and you know if I wanted to I could have gone down a needle size and things like that but um, 
I just decided not to basically. Um, so this pair is a little bit more, more comfortable. It doesn't kind of grip and hug the foot quite as much as I actually originally designed the pattern to. But you know, that's that's totally fine. And I'm still really um, enjoying wearing them. So yeah, that's, um, that's a tick and a win. And it's just nice to be padding around the house in a pair of gloriously violet, um, Vi violet socks. It's, it's kind of decadent, especially as they're meant to be summer socks and they're late and I'm wearing them with, you know, sheepskin slippers in the middle of the winter. But, you know, we we got to get our kicks while we can, right? So that is my finished object. And aside from that, it's just loads of works in progress. So going with the theme. Um, I did a bunch of work on my crochet granny squares. So here are some that I've knocked up over the last um, couple of evenings, couple of weekends. So you can see they're all using leftover yarns, the same kind of yarns that I'm trying to combine in different ways to try and add interest really. Um, and I'm, I'm really getting there with it, with this project in terms of the squares. I've got to make eight more complete squares and two half squares kind of triangle, right angle triangles using this granny square pattern. And the triangles will just fill in, you know, one of the corners around the neck just so it, um, just so it, it kind of, I can create a curve going around the neck essentially. I'm really not looking forward to weaving in the ends of, you know, 60 odd squares. Um, but yeah, so I've got eight more to do, um, but I have got to now put it on hiatus because I've kind of run out of scrap yarns of the right colours. Um, most, I've, I've basically used up like all the fun colours like pink and navy uh, and even the turquoise has gone down and I've just got lots of white and grey. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I need the variety of colours to kind of blend together um, in, in the palette, which means that I need to, you know, finish a few projects, use up a few things, um, either that or just bite the bullet and maybe buy like one, if I can find a small, um, a small ball of the right colours, like maybe 50 grams or even 25 grams, uh, or try and see if anyone I know possibly has any leftovers that I could purloin. Uh, and kind of trying not to go down that road though, because I kind of feel like, you know, that's a bit of a slippery slope, isn't it? Once you start using other people's leftovers, like I've been trying to reduce my leftovers and scrap yarns and stash yarns for so long. I, I'm kind of, trying not to be a sort of open door to other people's de-stashing, um, if, you, if you get what I mean, because I find that people are, you know, on the one hand, they're really, really generous. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you've, it, sometimes it can be hard to say no, or it can be a bit mean to, it can feel a bit mean to say like, no, I don't want that actually, uh, sort of in a nice way when they mean well, but also they are trying to declutter as well when I need to declutter. Does this make sense? Drop me a comment down below and um, let me know if you can empathise with this dilemma or um, what, what you've done if you've been in this position or do you just say yes to all of the yarn in the world and you know <laughs> that's the thing as well so yeah I'm, I've either got to just park this project for now and then just finish a whole load of other projects and just hope that uh, you know or maybe deliberately make decisions to <laughs> accumulate um, leftovers in the right colours or, or what I don't know but this is um, yeah it feels good that it's nearly there you know with, with so many granny squares having been made over the last, uh, I think it was a year and a half, roughly speaking, I have been working with this maybe a bit less, year and a quarter. So that's the granny squares. Um, on that note, because I knew that one of the colours that I needed um, was blue <laughs> or dark blue, here is a piece of dark blue knitting. And as you can see, it's a long piece of one by one rib. Here's the ball and you know really eagle-eyed and dedicated viewers might realize that this is um yarn that I've used in um some designs that I did uh, last year the yarn is from the Starlit Night Fingerless Gloves and Bundle of Stars Shawl and this is just uh, an extra hank of yarn that I got um, from, from making the sample. The yarn is by the Urban Pearl, who is Layla, who is a hand dyer based in London, in the opposite side of London to me. 
Um, and for my, for the, when I, for the designs that I used the yarn for originally, um, I held I held this yarn along with a strand of black mohair, and that created this real depth to the yarn. But this time I'm keeping it on its own, and it's brighter. Um, and if you're wondering what it is, it's going to be just a simple one by one rib beanie hat with a folded brim that I'm giving to my sister, and um, because she has need for a new hat. And yeah, when she, you know, she asked me very nicely. Um, she was like, oh, I know you're busy, but you know, I was happy to make it for her. And then I remembered I had this hank left over from the design project. And then from the crochet granny squares, I, I you know, I was like, oh, actually I could do some more, sort of like a bright navy blue to, to, to throw into the mix for that project. So it all just seemed to kind of tie together and it was a good project to cast on. Um, so I've just, you know, I've, I'm making up the pattern myself. It's relatively simple, but it does require some thought and it's just a bottom-up hat. In the past I've really struggled with sort of understanding how to calculate um, knitting for rib because the gauge measurement obviously changes so much with the stretch but I've come up with an idea of thinking about sort of stretch percentages in this pattern um, rather than just sort of doing the normal thing with knitted hats which is just make it smaller by a certain amount you know maybe three inches or four inches which is up to 10 centimeters um, you really really need to make knitted hats that are too small for your head because otherwise they will just fall off it's really important that they grip your head but it can be a bit of a fine line to tread because whilst there is a little bit of a tolerance, there's a bit of a leeway between head sizes, you know, it's not like it's not like buying a bra or even a glove, um, like, you know, like really fitted gloves where, you know, every centimetre or quarter of an inch difference makes you know, a big um, impact on the fit and how it feels on your body. You know, with, with hats, there is a little bit of tolerance with knitted hats, that is. But at the same time, there is a limit to the tolerance. Um, so, you know, for instance, whilst I don't need to grade my hat patterns when I, when I make hat patterns, I don't need to grade them like per quarter inch difference in the head size. Like, you know, I think I normally go between two or three inches. Um, so to translate that to centimetres, I don't need to like go every centimetre of head size. Um, I can go every like round about three centimetres. But still there's, there's kind of a limit to how much you can stretch it. So there's sort of this window where it needs to be, the hat needs to be smaller than your head, but not too much smaller or it will give you a headache. But not, if it's not small enough, it will be too loose and, and saggy and just, just slip off all of the time, basically. It's kind of a bit of a tight rope seems to be um, a bit of an exaggeration. But anyway, it's just a bit of a fine line. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think about it in terms of like percentage rather than just an, a sort of set amount um, smaller for this um, hat. And so whilst it looks really small, this is going to stretch by at least 50%. And because it's one by one rib, when it stretches 50%, all that means is that you see, you know, at the moment it's not stretched and you see all the knits, but stretch it out and you see the pearls in between as well. So it's just going to be like a typical kind of hipster hat and it's going to have a just a simple um, a wide folded brim you know bigger um, wider than this or taller than this if you like. Um, and I'm really pleased by the rolled edge of this fabric. It's a worsted weight superwash merino yarn that's been hand dyed and can you see it's just like a really nice roll <laughs> it's really pleasing um but the roll's going to be it's going to be much bigger um than that but yeah i just need to keep just need to keep knitting this is just a piece of ribbing basically um yeah and i really love working with worsted weight yarn it's just that really nice sweet spot i think when you get into a craft um after a while, you're just kind of always, you know, on the one hand, when, you, when you're trying to learn things, it's all about like pushing your boundaries, getting comfortable with making mistakes and learning how to fix them and thereby improving. But at a certain point, you just kind of hit these little sweet spots of things that you just really enjoy doing, things that just really work for you and you can kind of carry on doing them again and again and again uh, and just always feel like satisfied. <laughs> um, I think a good example is maybe like knitting you know once you've got your sock recipe down your sock calculations and, and like just kind of becoming a sock knitter or maybe it's like blankets a certain type of blanket project even if it's really big you know there's just something about it that just kind of always comes together and it's often quite simple and not too challenging but like the right balance of re relaxing where it's it's soothing rather than tedious 
And um, yeah, for me, working with worsted weight yarn is one of those moments because um, it's not too thick and heavy, but the projects just kind of move along quite quickly, um, but still produce a fabric thickness that is, um, yeah, it, it just kind of hangs really nicely around the body. And and yeah, like I said, the project the project goes quickly even in one by one rib. And I personally don't have a problem with rib. I quite enjoy knitting it, I you know, just, it, it, in a way, it's slightly slower than stocking stitch because you you know you have to move the yarn around between knit and purl all of the time. But there's something about that action that I quite enjoy <laughs> um, in the kind of micro level. So I think I'm going to get this hat done really quickly, uh, and then I'm considering writing up a pattern. As I said, it is it is quite easy. So please let me know um, what you think and whether you'd be interested in that. You know, I have been wondering whether I should just put out a bunch of patterns for the Crimson Sutri that are just very simple, um, because sometimes you're just looking for something simple, and also sometimes you just want someone else to have done all the calculations for you and, and, and like done all of the figuring out already, so that you can just sort of plug and play. I know that I've definitely been in that position myself. So yeah, please let me. Know Know what you think i'd be really interested to get your to get your feedback um all right so then speaking of my sister um recently we did a little nice little bonding activity and we did an embroidery workshop at a studio called ecrafts here in london um let me get the bag okay so here is the the bag with their, you know, their logo and their information on it. And um, what this studio is, it's all about promoting um, traditional handcraft techniques of China's ethnic minority groups. Um, and they have a really, I, I, I just, one of those um, Instagram recommendation kind of profiles that was actually a really good recommendation for me. Uh, and I've really enjoyed um, following along their Instagram. You know, they share lots of stuff. Um, about kind of techniques so there's a lot of like resist dyeing you know a little bit like um, batik or shibori um, there's different types of uh, embroidery and yeah so they they teach they sell the products that they've uh, they obviously import from the communities and um, they run they run workshops and oh they yeah they or oh, sell things they sell different things and they have like not just textile goods but they have like paper goods as well paper crafts and that kind of thing it's just, um, yeah, really, really pleasing and, and like nice to see a small business like that, which appears to be to be thriving. Um, and so they were do they were offering workshops like around around the new year, and I wanted to hang out with my sister. And so yeah, I thought that we we could go along to an embroidery workshop. Now um, the one that we ended up choosing is not one that's actually um, it's not a technique that's akin to um, any particular um, ethnic group in China is actually just general Chinese embroidery techniques. Um, but what we did was basically go to a workshop where we're embroidering this little lion. Um, and I think what got us was the eyebrows, <laughs> basically. So um, I'm, so here it is. So we got given like this basically as a kit and some instructions and the, it's, it's basically just filling in, you know, colouring in with embroidery because the pattern has been printed on. I think it's probably screen printed and we're just filling in with different stitches. We've got um, satin stitch, which um, they called flat stitch. Um, we've got, uh, what else have we got? There's a, there's this type of, um, there's this type of couching that happens as well. Those are the main ones. So this, the eyebrows are actually done with couching. You couch a chenille thread. And then there, oh, this outlining stitch as well, which is again a form of um, couching done with gold thread. It was really interesting to learn more about the um, kind of embroidery techniques in detail that I guess I just hadn't really given that much thought. Um, although I love to to sew and like pattern cut um, and knitting and crochet, um, in the past traditionally, you know, when it comes to surface decoration and like stitching, um, that hasn't really been my thing. Um, I'm, I, I guess I just end up being a little bit more interested in like construction overall. Um, so yeah, not so much like the, the, the embroidery and, and the, and the prettifying <laughs> at the end of it. Um, but my, it is something that my sister's much more into. So it's kind of nice that we've both got our own thing, but we, you know, we enjoy that. Like, obviously she benefits a lot from my knitting and, and <laughs> she's embroidered things for me as well in the past, which has been very, very cute of her. 
And um, yeah, so that's that. So although it's not really my thing, it's kind of it's kind of nice to do something different. Um, I like how social it is. Um, it's interesting how you have, you know, you really have to concentrate on embroidery. You need really good light. Um, you really are staring at it the whole time. You have to be quite careful of your posture. So yeah, it's definitely different from the sort of the knitting and the crochet where it's not that you don't have to pay attention, you do have to pay attention, but it's kind of not so painstaking. And also, um, yeah, you, it's kind of a bit, a bit physically larger as well to work with rather than taking tiny stitches. So um, I, as you can see, I've done, you know, maybe a quarter of it and I need to just like fill in the other eye. Um, it's going to have a big fluffy moustache. It's going to have some nice grinning white teeth. Uh, and then at the back, it's just like a simple, like a flower basically with some running stitches. So the back is, is relatively plain. Um, and then it's going to be an ornament. So, you know, just cut it out, stuff it with some wooding. Um, and then hang it up eventually. So haven't quite managed to get it done in time for Chinese New Year, but it's still been a nice activity to do through Chinese New Year. So um, yeah, that's my little line. I look forward to finishing him off and showing him to you. Um, I do, I've got to say, I do find the, um, the very stylistic uh, Chinese, like traditional illustration style. Sometimes I find them quite, um, funny as well as fun because they're, they're quite abstracted but then there's this general consensus about like you know this is what lions look like therefore these like funny little things are lions and then you can also get like dogs that kind of look like the lions and I think that they're meant to look like um like Pekingese dogs which have got those like flat faces and like hairy hairy little ears and I think they were called lion dogs as well at one point um and then, yeah, like, you know, this squiggle is a bat and this squiggle is a cloud. And, you know, they all mean slightly, slightly different things. But I got a really good book on um, Chinese symbolism that has, has been very helpful in, like, deciphering some of this stuff because... I think you tend to just take it for granted, like when, especially when you've just kind of have stuff around you or, you know, being from like a, a Chinese background, like maybe someone will just have something and have like, will have a bit of cushion or, you know, vase or whatever. We like, you see them in the Chinese restaurant, but you don't really think about like what all of the different patterns and symbols mean or, or even what they are because they're so abstract. So yeah, this is a lion, believe it or not, with a white fluffy moustache and white hairy eyebrows. <laughs> Um, so yeah, those are the main things that I have been working on. Um, the last project that I want to tell you about is a little bit more involved. And it's something that I've been working on slowly in the background um, since, oh, I think it was October. So let me grab that. Okay, so just stuffed into these bags here. So um, in October, October, I was invited to take part in a project called um, Traces, T-R-A-C-E-S. This is this very cool um, like graphic design <laughs> of this booklet, Traces, um, Stories of Migration. And I was invited to take part um, as a textile artist. And it's basically, it's quite a large um, community project and textile project that's been running for um, I want to say maybe about a year and a half um, and I was invited to take part in the the third I think it was the third and last phase so they, it's been going for a little while and they've they've run different phases of it and as you can see it's called stories of migration so it's a project that was started by the artist uh, Lucy Orta um, who she's very cool <laughs> if you want to look up the kind of project that she does um, She's done a lot of work around movement migration, sort of human migrations, um, storytelling and sort of environments as well um, in the past. And the idea of this, this project was basically to think about um, migration paths and per well, personal migration paths um, and histories that are linked to East London. Um, and the reason that it was a textile project is because East London um, how, you know, was historically um, the centre of garment manufacturing and textile industry um, on a sort of small and large scale uh, in, in London, like starting with the French Huguenot weavers, I think in the 16th century, who were um, 
oh god at one point i think they were like considered asylum seekers or because oh something oh my history is like my history is like merging but you know they they settled around spitalfields in in the city of london and then so sort of you know through that legacy you have you know later on in the east end um lots of like for instance jewish tailoring workshops were set up there uh, in, in east london and then sort of the sites where those were have then be often become taken over um not sorry not taken over like superseded um by like generally like bangladeshi um small small scale like garment piecing factories factories work workshops and workrooms it's not really been sort of factories if you like um like large scale factories in london generally like workrooms and workshops um and yeah like for a long time the fashion district has because because like of the the location of garment manufacturer um a lot of fashion workshops and so on have often been in um in east london um it's not it's not something that's exclusive to the area. There are different kind of locations around the city as well because it's a very, very large city. Um, but anyway, as you can see, there's like this long history of sort of garment manufacture and, and fashion industry um, sort of in the production sense a lot of the time with, with East London as sort of quite an important um, site, site within that. So this project basically was about gathering people with... Um, who were either associated with the textile industry or who were textile artists or artists working in textiles or, you know, interested in, in textiles, um, but also maybe people that just had an interest in it as well. It's like a big mixture in terms of skills um, to explore their own migration stories about sort of how they got to, you know, how, how we came to be in East London here. Um, because, you know, it's, it's one of the most, like, diverse areas, ethnically diverse areas, I would say probably in the country. Um, you know, I, I live in a borough, um, I live in a borough in outer London, on the outskirts, but, like, even on the borough that I live in, um, I think that, you know, sort of people that would tick the box for, like, white British are, are actually, I think it's less than 50%, um, or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's a place that's sort of got a got a long history to do with manufacturing and, and cloth and making, but also of the movements of people. And that is primarily because of the the docks and, and the, the location of the docks. Um, you know, many of the first kind of ethnic um, neighbourhoods clustered originally around the docks at different parts of the docks in East London. Um, that's where the first Chinatown was. You know, it's something that I write about in my PhD thesis, for instance. So yeah, it's a little bit of um, background to the project. And in the project, in terms of what we did, so we were basically invited to make a piece of um, a piece of work, a piece of artwork um, that told our story and our, our history, if you like, about our link to East London and expressed it through textiles. So there's all this sort of rhyming of material and experience. Um, and yeah, we were basically allowed to do whatever we wanted. Um, so I was in the, the, the group, the sort of phase in the group with lots of other textile artists and practitioners. And it was just this amazing, rich experience where for six weeks, once a week, I just went to this workshop and we just like kind of did a lot of skills sharing, um, learned, learned loads, just it was like a testing lab, just tried different things out. And, you know, with the aim of, of making a piece of work um, to show in a group exhibition that will go on in the summer. So more about that um, when, when, it, when it happens. Um, and yeah, so now I'm just, I'll just talk about my, my pieces. So they're not finished, unfortunately. Um, they were actually due to be finished at the beginning of December. Um, but if you've watched like episode, I think 59, I mentioned I had the flu for all of December. So I just couldn't meet any of the deadlines. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't get out of bed. So I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't really go and do all of the, the stuff basically. Um, so I've got to finish that off ASAP and get it sent off to them. Um, but, you know, th in terms of the, the brief and the project, like they were really open about how we wanted to approach it. Um, some people kind of created quite literal um, sort of visual visual representations of their migration history. And, and also there were people who, you know, were considered migrants, you know, up to, I think the, the, the bubble, the boundary was up to three generations. So there were people that, you know, they were the ones that moved, you know, there were people whose parents moved or, or like me, you know, I'm considered like third generation, but I could also be considered fifth um, or, you know, but also like I've moved around quite a lot. So there's, um, 
you know, also people like me who've, who've, you know, haven't had a straightforward, you know, I was there, then I moved here kind of thing, um, which I think is really common um, to experiences of, of diaspora and, and migration. Um, and actually, it was it was really fascinating. I, I'm talking a lot without showing me my pieces. Um, <laughs> here, here's my piece. Um, it was really fascinating to take part in this project purely as a participant. And it was something that was quite um, kind of nourishing and I felt really privileged to do it um, because, you know, I'm coming to the end of my PhD and for my PhD, like, I'm the person that facilitates workshops. I'm the person that does the research. I'm the one that had to, you know, look after my, my participants and, you know, gather the, the information and, you know, make them feel comfortable and all of this kind of stuff when I was conducting primary research. So it was quite nice to have someone else do that for me, <laughs> actually. Um, so when it came to... Um, my piece. I spent a long time having no idea what to do. Um, partly that's because I was really busy at the period in, in the period. Like I, it was the autumn. I had an exhibition to sort out as well of, of my own. Like let alone sort of participating in this other project for someone else. So I was kind of like quite a bad participant in some ways. Um, they they were very patient with me and extremely extremely lovely. Um, just getting all the bits out. So for my project. Um, what I ended up thinking about a lot was kind of trying to represent stories surrounding migration and heritage. Oh, and for anyone who is wondering, um, my own background is that I am Eurasian, so I'm half Malaysian Chinese and half European of a mixed Scandinavian and Eastern background, Eastern European, um, very mixed basically. Um, so yeah, I was basically thinking about how to tell the story around my own sort of heritage in a way that kind of was a little bit abstract. I didn't want to make it really literal, you know, like some participants chose to represent it with a lot of maps and, and things like that, or that, you know, it was about journeys and, and sort of mo moving from different locations and they'd represent the locations, but I didn't want to do it that way. Um, I also thought quite a lot about how, you know, having a very, very mixed ethnic background, it tends to have been defined by the people that did the moving, so my grandparents, um, as opposed to me, myself, and my own experience as a person with a mixed background and as a person who is always, you know, uh, racialized and, and ethnicized um, as a, a minority, and quite a lot of the time, frankly, as a foreigner, sadly, in the country of my of, of my birth, um, which is just something that happens to you when you live in in England or the UK, and you're not you're not a white person. You know, you kind of always extremely frequently questioned about your your origins, even when. Um, you know, at the moment I'm sharing this with, with viewers openly, but, you know, even in situations where it's actually, like, not appropriate to kind of go into the many, the multifaceted and at times quite dramatic, you know, family history of migration. So through the project, I really wanted to think about actually what is my own story and what does this mean for me as a woman and, and a person, um, and a person of sort of a certain age and a certain, you know, skill set, you know, technically, if you like. Um, yeah. And I, I had this sort of metaphor of like, I want to stand on my own two feet, which is, which is quite, it's quite hackneyed. Like, oh, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good, um, uh, it, that's a good idiom as well, since Hackney is in East London. But yeah, it felt a little bit hackneyed. Um, but I just decided to run with it. And it basically became about shoes and feet and socks. And um, quite early on when I was sort of um, sketching out and this is my sketchbook in here and like ideating different ideas, um, I had this vision of this pile of red clogs that were from Malacca in Malaysia, red Chinese clogs that um, we had by the back door that were kind of a communal family item. Um, here we go. And I had this idea of making a project all around these red clogs. And I was thinking about different ways of representing the clogs. Could I, should I knit them like intarsia? Should I knit a sculpture of them? Should I knit a frame of them? Should I make a wooden last, you know, like a mold of a foot? Um, how should I represent them? And there was something about the um, the red clogs, which are so, you know, they're so quintessentially, to me, of a place, which is Malacca, um, like the Chinese community in Malacca. Um, and they're so, like, Chinese because they're red and they're generally, they're quite crude. 
um, handmade. They are um, not particularly functional, but people wear them. You know, people wear them um, to, you know, they're quite high, so they get your foot off the ground, the dirty ground, you know, slip out in them in the rain. They'll dry quite quickly. They're, they're quite, they're quite bizarre. <laughs> And, you know, these days they're, they're sort of sold as a, as a tourist souvenir. Um, they are Chinese, so like the, the Chinese population in Southeast Asia is from southern China. Um, so um, most of them from either Guangdong or Fujian and other places as well. Um, so, you, you know, it's the same kind of iconography, if you like, um, that was brought over in diaspora. Um, so, yeah, I had lots of different ideas about how to represent the, the clogs. And... What I ended up going for was to knit a representation of the clogs. So um, I was thinking a lot about knitting um, in terms of a sculptural form and knitting a 3D piece, but I decided to um, knit um, a flat piece. Uh, most of the other participants have made a flat piece as well. I think like the majority, like 95%. So I quite liked the idea of having um, a flat piece. And a lot of the other participants, you know, they, they had like a piece of cloth. We were all given a piece of cloth to do what we wanted of it. And a lot of other people, they did embroidery, screen printing, you know, image transfers, different things, dyeing, resist dyeing on top of the cloth applique. But I wanted to knit my cloth, so I knitted a piece of cloth that was the same size. This is not finished, um, but what you can see in relief here is a pair of soles, hopefully. So it's just done as a knitted relief, knit and purl. And what I need to do is, I have a piece of red latex here, and I'm going to basically glue on the... Um, the foot, the strap that goes over the foot. I was thinking about like maybe knitting them in or, um, you know, different ways of doing it, but I think I'm just going to glue or maybe actually use little studs in the same way that the real clogs would. And to me, it's very interesting to sort of make a piece of knitting that is flat and square like this. And it's kind of akin to a canvas. And of course, canvas is cloth as well. And it will be mounted just like, you know, a, a piece of paper or canvas would be mounted on the wall in that it will show the piece of knitting flat which is quite different to how we're used to knitting functioning, which is that it, it moves and, and it curves and it stretches and it, you know, takes on forms around the body, even if, an, even if it's a blanket, which is a, you know, large um, flat piece. It still kind of drapes and falls around the body when it clothes you. Um, but this is a different way of looking at knitting, or it will be, you know, we'd be looking at it as a sort of background of itself that then creates something. Um, and then, yeah, I'm using this piece of latex. It's actually from a swimming cap. I looked into buying some latex, but um, I couldn't get a piece small enough. And I didn't want to buy, you know, I didn't want to buy half a meter of latex. Like I'm not going to be making latex uh, thongs anytime soon. Never say never, but not anytime soon. And I'm trying not to hoard materials. Um, See, I'm just going to cut this up and latex is um, an important material because of the rubber. Latex comes from the rubber plant and basically Malaysia is covered in rubber plantations. Um, and that is something that the Chinese community in Malaysia were, were involved in as well, working on them, operating them, managing them and so on and so forth. It's really sad. It's caused deforestation and definitely contributed to climate change. <laughs> but that's a story for another day. Um, so... Um, we've got the rubber, we've got the clog, we've got the colour red that's always um, associated with the Chinese community as well. Um, and then the last thing to talk about really is the knitting and the wool. Um, and I really wanted it to be a piece of knitting because that is just, you know, it's just a craft that I do. You're all here watching my, my vlog, my knitting vlog. It's just something that's very me, Anushka, um, much more than sort of, yeah, anyone else in my family, I would say, like on... In the European side, there are quite a few knitters as well. Um, but also what I thought was interesting was like in loads of cultures around the world, embroidery is actually what's associated with them. And that's certainly the case, you know, in, you know embroidery is famous in Poland and across Eastern Europe. You know, Chinese embroidery is famous. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a thing. I, I don't know, but but not so much knitting. And yet knitting is something that I have picked up. So it's something that is for me. Um, so yeah, it's kind of very, very authentic to me and in, in a very genuine way, as opposed to sort of a surface level thing. You know, on a surface level, you could say, oh, I could have done Chinese style embroidery because I have Chinese heritage, but actually that's got no meaning to me. Um, so actually doing something that is very much integrated in my life and has been for a long time um, was quite an important part of it as well. 
Um, and then the last thing to say is that the wool is lovely, lovely Scottish wool um, because I was born in Scotland. So <laughs> here we go. It's, it's not finished yet. You know, you're, you're looking at a pile of cloth, essentially. Um, but there's so much to say, isn't there, just about a piece of cloth and the way that a piece of cloth can, can function. Um, and we're kind of running out of time, but I have got more parts to the project as well, still unfinished. I'm also going to have two pairs... Um, Two pairs? Two pairs of socks? I think, no, I'm going to have a pair of socks. I've got the cloth. But basically I want to represent six feet, so three um, three pairs of feet, basically, um, through, the, <laughs> through the project, <laughs> through the work that I'm making. Um, so I'm going to save chatting about the sock part of the project um, for the next episode and start to wrap up here because um, there's so much more I could say about kind of looking at, you know, sort of engaging, looking sort of how, how we look and perceive and kind of, yeah, stare, stare at things and sort of art and craft and hierarchies and intangible values. But I'm going to use that as a little crumb <laughs> to keep you um, here at the Crimson Stitchery and waiting for um, and anticipating the next episode where I'll, I'll talk more about the project. So that's everything from me today. Thank you so much for watching. And again, a shout out to everybody who has supported this channel over on Patreon through a monthly membership subscription or with a one-off donation over on Ko-fi if a subscription doesn't suit you. Thank you so, so much. And an extra shout out to my supporters at the Crimson Queens tier, which is the highest level. This month is Angie Scheitel. Thank you so much, Angie, for your contribution. Um, now, don't forget the Crimson Whiff Along. Definitely get in touch and hopefully I will see you in the Whiff Along either on Instagram or in our Discord server sometime soon. That's it from me. Take care and happy knitting. Bye.